Okay, so I'm going to do a quick video going over just the basic introduction to propositional logic. Uh, propositional logic essentially is going to be anything that deals with a proposition, which is essentially a statement that we can apply some truth value to. We'll touch more on that in just a bit. But essentially, this is going to be the foundation of everything else in the course and everything that builds up to what we understand in basic computer hardware and software. So while it might seem like very rudimentary information, it is still the basic foundational structure for almost anything that we use today. So without further ado, let's go ahead and hop on over and just take a quick look. All right. So oops, my bad. Here we go. Or not. Can we, there we go. So what is the proposition? Proposition is a statement we can assign a definitive a truth value to. The truth values that we care about, in this case, we over here true and false. So, if we take a look, uh, there are an infinite number of prime numbers. This is a true statement. There are an infinite amount, therefore we can say it's true or false, in this case it is true. And the next one it says C is an object-oriented language, which it's not. It's used to create other object-oriented languages. But C itself, at a basis, is not an object-oriented language. Therefore, this would be a false statement. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that they are typically declarations. So we have, yes, I know these aren't actually sentences. Well, this one's not a sentence, it's a question, but I digress, it's just a statement, essentially. So what time is it? Well, that's a question, not a proposition. Therefore, it's not true or false. And go to store as a command, also not a proposition. Therefore, it is also neither true nor false. So, in this case, we care mostly about declarations. We are declaring something, and we need to determine is that declaration or proposition true or false. Now, true statements and truth values, we care about the declaration aspect, we care about propositions. But for the values, we care about specifically true and false. There are, oops, unknown and matter of opinion based statements. Examples, when we can tell that two plus two is four, well yes, this is gonna be true. Two plus two is five is false. But Monday we cloudy. Well, maybe let's consider the fact it's maybe Saturday today. We don't know what Monday's gonna be. We might have a weather app or something that says it'll be cloudy, but until that day comes, we can't determine it, so it is currently unknown. And this one says the song is good. Well, this is a matter of opinion, so it's neither true nor false, so it's a state of almost like Schrodinger's cat in a way. Of it can be both. Uh, but we don't know. So we can't really determine that. Now, there is propositional logic that handles these two. We are not going to touch on that because we specifically care about binary based propositional logic of true and false because these boil down to one or zero, just like Boolean logic. Now, for our propositions, we've only been doing singular statements, but we can join together multiple based on some propositional statements and operations like this conjunction, disjunctions, or, and a few others. Let's go ahead and touch on those real quick. So, every time we do these logical operations, or just propositions in general, we can make a table out of it, known as a truth table. And this is going to essentially accommodate and show every single possible value we have. So in this case, we have some P and it with Q, where P can join with Q. We'll touch on conjunction in just a second. But this is one proposition, P, and a proposition Q, and then my actual compound proposition of P and Q. So P could be true or false, and Q can also be true or false. So this combinational pattern here has every single possible outcome, well, every single possible input, which then, when you add them all together, generates our result over here of every single possible input's outcome. So it's not as hard as it might seem. It's a lot of just jargon here. But essentially, truth tables just say, hey, these are all the possible inputs. Give us the outputs for it. This is a pretty simple one, honestly, where there's only two variables, one operation happening. But they can get quite complex later on. Now, for the actual operations, 
we'll start with conjunction. So they denoted by this kind of upside down caret, and it just means and. You might see it like an asterisk for multiplication. You might also see it in ampersand if you're doing, say, programming languages, doing bitwise and operations, like an if statement or something like that. So if x and y, or if x equals equals zero and y is less than two. So something like this. Maybe you see two of them together at the same time, like if you're doing C or C++, you might see something like this. It's the same thing. So when we read it, we read this as P and Q, and it's true only when all propositions are true. So if you look at this truth table, we have one instance where both P and Q are true, and that is the only time that the actual compound proposition is also true. And if you want to have an easier time of understanding this, we can just boil this down to basic algebra and treat it like math based on our asterisk here. So if we take this and do multiplication on all of these, and we convert our trues to one, our falses to zero, then you can see that one times one is one, and all the rest of them have multiplication by zero, so they'd all be zero. Convert those back, and you get true, false, false, false. Not too bad. Similarly, we have disjunction, which is a, looks like a V, and you might see it as a plus for addition, or you might see it as this bar, so if we go back to the if, x equals, equals zero, you might see two bars, y is greater than two. So this is saying or, just in case you've ever seen that before. And then it is just read P or Q. And it's true when at least one proposition is true. And this is due to viewing it more like addition opposed to multiplication. So one, 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 zero, zero, one, zero, zero. Now, yes, I know that one plus one is not gonna be one like here, but since we only have options of one and zero, this one or one ends up being one since there's at least one true statement in the proposition. So that's the one that kind of get maybe a little bit tricky, but it's just gonna be one. So one plus zero is gonna be one, zero plus one is gonna be one, zero plus zero is zero. And if you apply these to logical or, it lines up exactly the same. Moving on, we have one that doesn't apply near as well because there's no basic algebra for this, which is the exclusive or operation, which you might better know as Zor. It kind of looks like a, a crosshair in a way. It's a plus with an inside of a circle. But it is read P exclusive or Q. It's true only when the propositions differ from each other. So if we take a look at it, when we have them be the same, so true, Zor, true, or F, Zor, false. Oh, no, yeah, F, False or false, I'm sorry. Reading too literally. We end up with falses because the inputs are the same. Now, if our inputs differ from each other, or more specifically, they are exclusive to each other, then we end up with true. Like so. So true or false, or false or true, we end up with true. So that should be too bad. And negation is very, very easy. It's also known as not. You might have seen this more like an exclamation mark, a bang, or something like that. Um, but essentially, it is just going to give you the opposite truth value. So if we put it in true, you get false. If you put it in false, you get true. It's not too bad. Now, just like most math, there is an order of operations to things. In basic propositions of logic, we have parentheses take the highest precedence. Negation has second highest precedence. Conjunction has third and then disjunction is the lowest and this kind of adds up very very similar to regular algebra where parentheses always come first uh, you can view this as almost saying negative one times something so it would happen right before or in line with conjunction but this might be the kind of strangest one but conjunction has higher precedence in addition and this is most of the main part to take away if you're confused on how the order of things happen. Conjunction always happens before disjunction and multiplication always happens for addition. So just a very similar aspect there. Now, 
with that in mind, let's take a look at this more complex propound, uh, compound proposition. We have P anded with negated Q R or R. Okay, we want to assume that P is true, Q is false, and R is also true. So let's go ahead and substitute these values. We have true, handed with negated, false, or with true. So if we or, we have, first off, we have parentheses, we need to do it first. So true, conjoined with negated, uh, let's see, false, or with true, well, assume or, and we know there's a true value there, so it has to be true. And then we have true, handed with negated true, which is gonna be false. And finally, have conjunction or and with false, so we know that it must be false. Look at it, and just like so, you see that we do what's inside the parentheses first, we apply our negation, and then we finally do our disjunction, and we're left with a false. Now, we didn't do a true table there because we were just caring about very specific inputs. However, more often than not, we want to analyze all possible inputs and get all possible results. So, if we fill out the truth table in terms of the actual inputs, it's very similar to counting in binary, where we have all zeros counting up to all ones, uh, bottom top. Now, if you start zero zero ended one, that's fine too. It doesn't really matter the actual order. What you're going to see is more in line of starting with true and ending with false just throughout this course. Now, for a few more notes here, if you get lost on how to count binary, basically you can see all zeros, one, next one would be zero, one, zero, zero, one, 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 zero, zero, one, zero, one, 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 zero, one, one, one. Now, another way to note it is that a column is necessary for each variable and the formula. Okay, so what I mean by that is let's take a look at the actual formula itself or the expression here. We have in parentheses P or with R and with negated Q. So we have three unique variables to take into account P, Q, and R. So we need a column for each of these because they will all need their own inputs. So we need to accommodate for all of them. So we end up with three columns. And then we need one last column for the actual result. So these are the required columns right here. Oops. Okay, now when it comes to actually lining these up, know that the rightmost variable column will alternate true and false every single time. So we have true and false, true and false, true and false, true and false. So it alternates every single one. Now the next column, the second one, will alternate true, true, false, false. So true, true, false, false, true, true, false, false. Let me rewrite this a little bit. So it alternates every one. Okay. And the third column will alternate every four. So true, 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 oh, true, 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 false, 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 false. There we go. Now, one thing that might help. Let me clear this up real quick since it's already been shown. But we can take a look at this is zero, this is one, this is two. So if we count that as two to the zero, that equals one. So that means this column will alternate every single one. Next up will be two to the one, which equals two. So it alternates every single two. And then the next one we have two to the two, which is four. So it alternates every single four. And now logically, you'd be able to tell that if we did three, we'd have two to the three, which equals eight. And that'd be true, 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 eight trues. And then you'd have eight falses after that. We don't have that right now, so we're not gonna worry about it. But a real quick way is if you wanna know the total number of rows that you'll need then you can do two to the n, which n being the number of variables, the number of unique variables in the formula. In our case, we have p, q, and r, so that's three. 
Okay, three equals eight. And there's four T's, four F's. That accommodates eight unique rows. That's basically it. We care about powers of two specifically because our combinations are going to be of two different digits or values in this case of true and false. So it works on a binary scaling. So two being our base, and then the number of unique inputs accommodating all possible values. So it's every possible combination that we can get. Okay? And then also the formula column is assigned the truth value for that line. So you would solve out, you would substitute true into all of these, true, true, false for the next one, so on and so forth, and get the actual answer afterwards. Okay. Now, one last thing to note is in that previous one, we only had our three unique variables and then the actual formula. And it was basically a task as though you need to fill this out. And that would be fairly complex just if you're doing it all at once. But you don't have to do that. If you want, and I do suggest this if you ever actually end up filling out a truth table, you'd want to break it down into unique operations. So let's take a look at this expression here. So we can take a look at the fact that we have P just joins R as an operation. So we can make a column out of that and get all those results. And that would be, let's just say that this now equals, uh, <laughs> I don't know, uh, M. Let's just say M, okay? And then let's take a look and see that this operation negation of Q is another one. Let me make a column for that. Now let's call it n. All of a sudden, we can just say that we have m and join with n, and that would accommodate our overall expression. Now instead of having to fill out or comp like compute this all at once and have a column for it, you could break this down into two different operations of m and of n. So it'd be more like something like this where you don't have to pay attention to the actual unique variables because you already have the results of their individual operations here. And you can just add these two columns together to get the overall result of the expression. So you can find some intermediate steps to make life a lot easier filling out truth things. And then you still end up with the same results as if though you just did the entire expression all at once. And that's pretty much the basis of process logic. Now it does get more complex going forward, but this is the beginner steps of just going through some of the operations, figuring out what truth tables are, and just a few other things in terms of what is the goal of this, why do we care about it, and how does it work essentially. The reason we care about it, well, it gives us all possible values of whatever it is that we are trying to determine. Is it true or false? We care about true or false because we work on a binary system of logic which is what is applied to computer science, computer engineering, and hardware and software. And aside from that, the other thing is just all the different operations or different rationales of com combining things. So maybe we want to say, oh, I, this is only true if both of the inputs in are coming true. Maybe this one is true if at least one is. So that would be your and and your or. And then the other ones are, Zor is a little bit interesting in its use cases, but negation is just saying, hey, I want to say the opposite. So I like say um, the light is off if the switch is not up. So at that point, you could have said it a different way, but if you want to accommodate for something not being done, then we have negation operation. So it still works on a logical system, but it just has its own specific operation. Now, we'll get into more different operations and more specific versions of Robinson's logic and more complex aspects, because what we've done here today it's just really, really simple. So, hope you learned something. Hope it's not too bad. And hopefully you enjoy the rest of the uh, actual chapter. This chapter one can be a little bit long in the tooth just because a lot of it's very, very basic or a lot of it's really, really tedious. So, hopefully it's not too bad. And I'll see you guys in the next video. All right.